Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would like to welcome you all to the eight Allot webinar. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, uh, guest speaker for today, uh, Professor Georgi Keseru. I hope my pronunciation was uh, good enough. Um, Professor Keseru is uh, heading the um, uh, Medicinal Chemistry Research Group at uh, RCNS in uh, Budapest, and is also a full professor at the um, Budapest University of Technology and uh, Economics. Um, of course, he is a, a leading expert in the, in the field of uh, uh, medicinal chemistry and drug discovery. And today, um, he will give us uh, a talk about the design and the synthesis of covalent allosteric probes. So um, without further ado, uh, the Professor Casero, the, the floor is uh, yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Simone, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I share my screen. Yeah. And uh, uh, please indicate whether or not uh, it is visible. Yeah, then we can see it. Okay, I'm just checking that. Uh, do you see the uh, full screen? No, I will say no. that. Okay. Okay, then uh, I'm coming back and uh, I'm sharing that version. No, I guess it should be okay. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yes. So thank you again for uh, this opportunity just to talk about a little bit on the design and synthesis of covalent allosteric probes. Just before uh, doing that, uh, I would like to introduce you the covalent mechanism of action. On the first slide, uh, you see that basically uh, the best selling molecules actually uh, uh, identified for the last year uh, contains uh, many different entities. That includes small molecules, includes biologics, and also diagnostics. However, if you are now focusing to the marketed drugs, uh, we can conclude that basically they have a reversible mechanism of action and actually less than 1% of the drugs bind irreversibly. Typically these uh, drugs are identified as covalent uh, drugs or having a covalent mechanism of action. Let me show to introduce you uh, the basic difference between reversible and irreversible binding. So the a very classical reversible binding mechanism is uh, that uh, the small molecule is typically recognized by its protein target and form the protein uh, uh, ligand complex. However, it is in a dynamic equilibrium with the free solvated ligand. And uh, uh, this is basically uh, the model described by the very traditional uh, lock and key uh, model, as you could see here. Uh, the receptor is able to recognize ligand A, but could not recognize uh, ligand B. So what is the difference uh, in the case of the irreversible mechanism of binding? Uh, so basically the difference is that uh, we put some glue uh, to uh, or a part uh, of the covalent ligand, and in this case, uh, the glue uh, will be an electrophilic functionality that could react with the uh, nucleophilic residues of uh, the protein target. And uh, therefore, uh, the binding of the ligand uh, will be practically irreversible. From a chemistry point of view, we can classify covalent binding uh, as a binding event when the ligand forms a covalent bond to the target. As mentioned earlier, the electrophilic ligands or the electrophilic moiety of the ligands uh, might target different uh, protein nucleophiles available at the binding side of the protein. That includes uh, a cysteine thiol, a threonine or tyrosine OHs, and uh, the a minor group of lysines or histidine. It is important to note that basically the covalent uh, binding uh, has two uh, 
uh, to have a two-step mechanism. The first step is uh, the molecular recognition of uh, the covalent ligand uh, by the target protein. And this is basically the non-covalent step uh, of covalent binding. And in this step, the molecular recognition still uh, plays an important role uh, <clears throat> in the non-covalent binding of uh, the ligand. And the next step is, this is basically uh, the step where the covalent bond is formed, uh, just because uh, the non-covalent complex represents uh, the electrophilic group in a close vicinity of the protein nucleophile we targeted, and a covalent bond is formed. Basically, depending on the uh, chemistry we are using for covalent labeling, covalent binding might be both irreversible or reversible. Uh, whether we use uh, irreversible or reversible chemical reactions. For example, an irreversible chemical reaction uh, is a nucleophilic substitution reaction and a reversible chemical reaction might be, for example, the uh, Michael addition, because we know not only the Michael addition, but uh, also the reverse uh, or retro Michael addition. We were pretty much interested in, and we are still pretty much interested in covalent binding mechanism because there are many new applications uh, for covalent ligands that includes covalent fragments, covalent inhibitors, uh, antibody drug, drug can you guess, or developing chemical biology probes. When we are talking about uh, the use of covalent mechanism of action for allosteric uh, ligands, then we are trying to combine uh, the advantages of covalent mechanism of action and uh, the advantages of allosteric uh, molecular mechanism. In the case of the covalent mechanism of action, we uh, are expecting enhanced, poten enhanced potency, higher selectivity, better pharmacodynamics and prolonged duration of action. Basically all uh, of these features are directly connected to the formation of the covalent bond. On the other hand, there are specific uh, uh, advantages that are associated with the allosteric mechanism of action. Uh, here, uh, we can expect higher specificity, lower toxicity, and also uh, some pharmacology type of uh, benefits, namely uh, the endogenous ligand is typically uh, act only, uh, uh, the allosteric ligand is typically act only if the endogenous ligand is already bound and uh, modulating the, 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 the uh, proteins by the allosteric mechanism of action, we can maintain the natural uh, cycle. So therefore, it seems that uh, combining the uh, pharmacological benefits of covalent mechanism and allosteric uh, approaches uh, would be beneficial. And this uh, combination suggests to develop covalent allosteric ligands. We have also another uh, important approach uh, we are using that these are basically the fragment-based uh, drug discovery. And uh, typically we are starting uh, from small molecule fragments because combining the benefits of fragment-based drug discovery and covalent mechanism of action would make uh, to, uh, the identification of uh, viable chemical starting points for developing covalent allosteric modulators uh, easier. And the reason why we think that uh, covalent fragments would be uh, ideal starting points for covalent uh, allosteric molecules is that, that in the case of a fragment-based drug discovery, uh, we can uh, sample the available chemical space uh, more effectively. We have a higher chance of binding even uh, small or uh, even cryptic uh, packets that are usually the case in the, uh, for allosteric uh, binding sites. Due to the 
small and polar nature of the fragments, we have typically better physical chemical profile and fragments typically provide uh, rational optimization strategies, especially if uh, the uh, 3D structure of the uh, protein fragment compass is available. So uh, when we are considering uh, covalent fragments, it's a suitable starting point for developing covalent thermostatic inhibitors. We uh, think that covalent fragments has some characteristic uh, advantages over uh, the simple fragments or the non-covalent fragments because uh, due to the formation of the new chemical bond, it is easier to detect them. They have enhanced potency. They have an improved target engagement and uh, just because of the fixed binding mode of the covalent fragments, uh, they could be optimized more easily, especially in the case of the uh, if structure information is available. So let me show you uh, uh, first uh, the development of mapping libraries uh, that are useful to identify uh, suitable protein nucleophiles uh, in the vicinity of uh, allosteric or even autosteric uh, binding sites. So uh, at the very beginning of our work, uh, we were pretty much interested in the cysteine residues, and therefore we developed a cysteine mapping library. Uh, and uh, we identified uh, a common scaffold, and in our case, it was the beast trifluoromethyl phenyl scaffold. And as you see here uh, in the colored region of the uh, slide, that we equip pretty much the same non covalent scaffold, the beast trifluoromethyl scaffold, with different electrophilic functionalities. In the yellow area, uh, I collected uh, all the electrophilic residues that can be considered as Michael acceptors. Uh, on the orange place uh, shows you uh, different functionalities that are electrophilic and uh, they could react in nucleophilic addition reaction. In the blue area uh, highlights the uh, electrophilic functionalities that react in nucleophilic substitution reaction. And we added two examples, one for the oxidation, that is a simple thiol group, and a nucleophilic addition elimination uh, reaction represented by the aldehyde. So the key question here is why exactly we picked up uh, this trifluoromethyl phenyl, a non common scaffold. So first, uh, we found that the, uh, basically the electron withdrawing character of the uh, two trifluoromethyl group would enhance uh, the activity of the warheads. On the other hand, just because of the phenyl ring, uh, these small fragments could be easily uh, detected by HPLC uh, UV, HPLC MS. And also by fluorine 19 and emerge just because of the, uh, of the six fluorine atoms uh, available at the non covalent scaffold. Furthermore, this scaffold showed no interference with any of the assay components of the biology assays. So, altogether, uh, we equip the previously mentioned 24 different electrophilic warheads that represents these five different chemistries. Uh, one advantage of this set uh, is clearly that, it, that the individual compounds uh, covers a wide range of electrophilicity. And uh, just because of the five different chemistries, uh, these chemistries cover a range of pre and post reaction geometries, because I would like to highlight that in the covalent mechanism of action, it is also the transition state of the covalent labeling reaction that should be accommodated by the active site uh, during the labeling reaction. And just because that the 
uh, transition state of the different reactions are different in terms of uh, electrostatic and also steric uh, character, it is important to represent uh, uh, a range of uh, different chemistries. So uh, we use uh, this mapping library for the assessment of reactivity and accessibility of system residues of different proteins. So on the next slide, I show you just five examples that include a new ray that's an antibacterial target, a MOA, uh, that's a CNS uh, uh, target, and the HDAC8, uh, and I will, explain a little bit more on age decade uh, at this stage uh, you should know that uh, uh, age decade is an oncology target as is uh, the immunoproteosome and uh, finally I also included uh, a couple of uh, uh, slides on KRAS D12C so uh, in the case of um, U -ray. Uh, we screened the small library, uh, the mapping library, and we identified warheads that are typically better than uh, the acrylamides. Here you could see uh, these uh, uh, columns uh, indicating the Mura, Mura IC50 values measured by uh, uh, the incubation after the incubation of different uh, fragments uh, from the mapping library. The acrylamide represents the first one, uh, and we observed 164 uh, nanomolar IC50 when investigated again the active site of mu A, rep, uh, having the system uh, 115 uh, available for covalent modifications. And this is basically the site where the only known drug phosphomycin attacks uh, mu A during its antibacterial action. However, you could see here that, for example, uh, fragments five, six, uh, 11, uh, 21, 24, and 27 showed uh, better uh, IC50 as compared uh, to uh, the very well-known and widely used acrylamides. Unfortunately, uh, number five and number six uh, these are malamides. These are pretty much promiscuous molecules, so therefore we could not consider these uh, warheads as useful uh, for developing a novel covalent mu ray inhibitors. However, uh, you could see the second best one uh, is 11. This is the vinyl sulfon uh, fragment that showed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, pretty good uh, Mure A IC50. So we can consider uh, vinyl sulfon as a suitable uh, warhead uh, attacking this particular uh, system available for Mure A inhibition. Uh, on the lower right corner, you could see uh, the mass spectrometry analysis. Uh, uh, after the digestion of the protein, indicating that actually the vinyl sulfon uh, moiety attacked uh, this uh, cysteine residue that is exactly cysteine 115, uh, indicated uh, by the yellow C uh, letter here. Okay, so uh, our next uh, target was MOA. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, uh, monoamine oxidase, uh, that is a uh, known and uh, also validated target for Parkinsonism, uh, has basically two different isoforms, uh, monoamine oxidase A and B. And uh, there are many uh, inhibitors, uh, including saligilin, uh, that selectively block uh, monoamine oxidase B activity. And uh, selegilin, this is an acetylenic compound uh, that form a covalent adduct uh, for the, uh, uh, with the FAD uh, cofactor that is needed for the catalytic action of monoamine oxidase B. 
So uh, our intention uh, was to identify a uh, novel covalent uh, inhibitor that is selectively blocking monoamine oxidase A. And uh, you could see here uh, that uh, we identified a different fragments uh, with a low micromolar affinity. And uh, their biological activity uh, was pretty much in the same range as uh, the known non-covalent drug chlorgeline uh, showed. A uh, harmaline uh, that is a uh, selective monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. And uh, we performed MSMS proteomics uh, to check whether or not uh, these fragments, uh, fragments 11, 12, and 15, because fragment six again, uh, this is the pr more promiscuous malamid. So uh, that these fragments uh, would able to label the uh, a protein uh, just to demonstrate their covalent mechanism of action. And it was a big, big surprise that uh, we detected uh, two cysteine residues pretty close to each other in monoamine oxidase A that we were able to label by these compounds uh, 11, 12, and 15 with the low nanomolar, uh, micromolar IC50. So basically, uh, these covalent uh, compounds are nothing to do with the fat cofactor that was in the case of the covalent monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, but instead uh, they are the first cysteine targeting allosteric covalent inhibitors that are selectively blocking uh, MO A enzyme. The next example I would like to show this is the age decade. Uh, here we used uh, a different. Um, uh, or the same library and they identified uh, different compounds. Again, the promiscuous malamids, uh, numbers uh, five and six. However, uh, we identified uh, a bromoketone and also the vinyl sulfon uh, compounds that were uh, labeled uh, specifically uh, two regions of HDAC8. One was the uh, C, uh, to 275, uh, uh, 352, uh, uh, that is uh, originally disulfide bond responsible for the activity regulation of the enzyme. And uh, uh, more interestingly, a redox switch formed by these two cysteines around the 100 uh, uh, region of uh, the age decade. So here you could see again uh, a mass pack. Uh, demonstrating the specific labeling uh, of HDAC8 uh, uh, redox switch uh, by these small uh, bistrifluoromethyl phenyl type uh, allosteric covalent inhibitors. The next example I show you, this is a pretty much complicated uh, system. This is the immunoproteosome. Uh, that consists of 27 different proteins. And in this case, uh, uh, using again the same uh, mapping library, we were able to label selectively only one protein, the beta 5i subunit uh, of the immunoproteosome, as demonstrated by uh, the mass spectrum here. So this is a very good example that uh, demonstrates using a very small covalent fragment, we were able to identify a new uh, covalent ligand uh, for uh, these beta-5 subunit of a very large uh, multiple protein uh, system. And finally, uh, this is uh, the uh, KRFG12C. 
uh, that is a very famous um, oncology target previously considered to be undruggable. And here we used uh, fluoro 19 NMR screening, first identifying uh, the fragment that is, or a fragment that is able to label uh, the protein. In this case, we were pretty much interested in to label the, uh, this cysteine that is an oncogenic mutant of the KRAS. So in this small insert here, you could see that uh, using uh, uh, fragment one, that was the acrylamide type of uh, bistrifluoromethylphenyl uh, fragment. Uh, after 24 hours, we detected the almost complete labeling of uh, this uh, cysteine available at the uh, 12th position of KRAS. And uh, Next, we analyzed a little bit the uh, targeted site. Uh, here you could see the uh, N15 HSQC uh, spectra. Uh, this is a cysteine 12 uh, here, and you could see some other residues that are, uh, that are involved in the non-covalent contents of this small uh, fragment on the basis of the covalent information and also the non-covalent contact uh, residues, we were able to identify the allosteric size that uh, is available for uh, covalent targeting. Uh, based on the success of this small mapping library that were developed against the system residues, uh, more recently, we completed uh, another mapping library uh, available for uh, the evaluation of the reactivity and tractability of uh, lysine residues. So uh, actually we consider lysines uh, even more uh, suitable targets as compared to cysteines because uh, cysteine is a very rare uh, residue, especially as compared to uh, the lysines. Uh, the good news is that lysines are frequently uh, play a, a critical role in the protein functions. And a more recent analysis of uh, tractable lysine residues in the uh, immune and cancer cell proteome identified about 3,000 different lysines that seems to be druggable. The important point is that uh, in the case of lysines, that is, uh, typically less nucleophilic as compared to the cysteine residues, we can only uh, target the deprotonated uh, lysines. These are typically the inner lysines uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are embedded in the uh, uh, binding site, uh, while uh, surface lysines are typically protonated and could not be uh, uh, targeted by uh, these electrophiles. So we should know that lysines are typically less nucleophilic as compared to the uh, cysteine as mentioned. So we need new chemistries and uh, uh, we need a little bit more electrophilic warheads. On the other hand, we should optimize these warheads because they should uh, have uh, enough stability uh, that uh, makes them available for uh, screening in uh, adverse conditions. So uh, in this case, we use pretty much the same non-covalent scaffold that was uh, equipped by a, a different uh, lysine reactive electrophiles. In this case, uh, we also mapped uh, different chemistries that includes nucleophilic substitution, nucleophilic addition elimination reactions, uh, including acylation, sulfonylations, and uh, direct nucleophilic additions and conjugate uh, additions as well. So actually, uh, we made both the cysteine and the lysine uh, mapping libraries available within the ALOD network. Uh, in one hand, uh, uh, Mark Nazari's group uh, are investigating uh, these libraries against the SHIP2 uh, target. We are trying to identify 
a new uh, covalent allosteric starting points for developing uh, new covalent inhibitors. And uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Christoph Rademacher and uh, his group investigating uh, these uh, mapping libraries against uh, uh, different ligase uh, targets. And of course, uh, we will be more than happy to make uh, these libraries available for other allied members as well. On the next part of my talk, I would like to focus uh, on our efforts, just expanding the current world space. Uh, and uh, I would like to introduce you uh, electrophilic heterocycles. So basically uh, the reason why we uh, uh, designed these new types of warheads was that uh, in the case of the most popular approach, uh, it is an alcovalent ligand that is typically equipped uh, with an electrophilic functionality. But unfortunately, uh, when we put the electrophilic functionality to a known ligand, then we should add at least three, four heavy atoms. And uh, this is a pretty large change uh, at the binding side that might affect the molecular recognition and even the binding mode of the non-covalent scaffold. So therefore, it is relatively hard to balance between the affinity and reactivity just because of the changing binding mode and the changing uh, interaction patterns formed uh, at the uh, binding side. So therefore, we thought that what about if we start from heterocycles that is otherwise uh, um, a frequent uh, um, building blocks of uh, uh, different ligands and drugs. And uh, we activate these heterocycles uh, uh, using uh, or improving the electron redrawing character of the heterocycles and in this case, with adding only one or two atoms, uh, we can develop a new type of warhead that are capable to uh, label nucleophilic protein residues by nucleophilic substitution or nucleophilic addition reactions. So here are the uh, conceptual electrophilic heterocycles. You could see that both the six members and the five member rings contains at least one nitrogen. And the substituents that uh, should show some electrophilic character uh, includes only one or two atoms. In the case of the halogens, that is obviously one atom of chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Or uh, we can use the nitrile, a vinyl, and the ethanyl uh, substituent that the both uh, can uh, react in, ele in uh, electrophilic or nucleophilic, uh, or sorry, nucleophilic substitution or addition reaction. Uh, we and others uh, recognized that if we N-methylate these heterocycles, uh, basically to uh, quaternarize the nitrogen atom uh, available in the heterocycles, then we can even, we can improve uh, the electrophilicity of these heterocycles even further. Just uh, therefore, we prepared the unmethylated version of the heterocycles as well. So uh, conceptually we can consider these electrophilic heterocycles as the covalent version of the Aztex minifrag uh, library. Uh, originally Aztecs developed minifrags uh, for crystallographic screening, uh, and uh, they identified the big advantage of these uh, ultra low molecular weight uh, compounds, just because they could identify not only the hot spot that is usually uh, the binding site for the fragments, but nearby warm spots as well, and uh, indicating immediately uh, the growing vector uh, for fragment optimization. Furthermore, 
uh, as Turks demonstrated, then mini frags are especially uh, well suited uh, to sample the chemical space and to detect unprecedented ligand binding packets and more specifically allosteric packets. So therefore, uh, we think that if we make uh, Aztex mini frags covalent in the form uh, of electrophilic heterocycles, we can even enhance uh, the mapping properties of these uh, small fragments further. And we can replace X-ray screening by the more simple uh, mass spectrometry-based uh, screening campaigns. So here I show you uh, the uh, covalent minifrags uh, we synthesized. Uh, on the top table, you could see the non-methylated version of the heterocycles. And uh, you could see that there is a blue spot at one certain position of the heterocycles. And this is uh, the position we applied uh, the different substituents, the chlorine, bromine, iodine, the nitrile, the vinyl, and the ethanol group. And uh, uh, on the top table, you could see the uh, half lives of these fragments as measured against GSH as a surrogate uh, 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 test. On the lower table, uh, you could see uh, the animethylated version uh, of these heterocycles and uh, the blue spot again uh, labels uh, the exact position of the substituent and uh, we used both the methylated and the uh, non-methylated library uh, as a screening library against uh, uh, different proteins, including HDAC8, that will be uh, our example uh, for today. We used first biochemical methodology, just determining the IC50 values and uh, first the remaining activity and then the IC50 values uh just to identify functionally relevant uh, uh inhibition and the next we analyzed uh the site of labeling using uh nmr and mass spectrometry uh in our case uh to identify the new sites of uh new binding sites that could be considered allostrate in the case of age decade so here you could see the screening result we obtained uh, for our target. And uh, on the top table, you could see the non-methylated version of the electrophilic heterocycles indicating that only few uh, colored green uh, showed reasonable low IC50 against the, the protein target. Contrary, however, the more electrophilic Methylated minifrags uh, labeled the HDAC protein very, very effectively. So there is a clear indication that a more electrophilic and methylated version of the minifrags provided a much better average IC50 and much better heat rate as compared to the uh, non methylated version. Next, we selected the 11 best fragments, and these were all, of course, uh, and methylated. And uh, we use mass spectrometry analysis, as mentioned earlier, just to identify the exact site of labeling on the white type age decade. And uh, also, we check the functional relevance of these labeling sites in parallel by measuring the IC50 on double and triple mutant uh, cysteine mutant HDAC uh, proteins. Uh, on that basis, uh, we identified uh, the functionally relevant binding sites you could see here. I already mentioned uh, these two, uh, the activated uh, regulator and the redox switch site, uh, we identified by other uh, covalent fragments as well. 
So now I would like to focus on a new binding sites uh, we identified as potential new allosteric covalent uh, sites for the age decade. And uh, these are typically the uh, C28 uh, located uh, here, and also uh, a C244 and uh, C314. So these are the new sites uh, that were identified in addition to the redox and the activated regulator sites of the protein. So the next step uh, was uh, just to demonstrate that starting from uh, this type of N-methylated covalent inhibitors, we could develop uh, a more specific and targeted covalent inhibitor. So for this purpose, we started for an already known uh, age decade inhibitor. Uh, and uh, we identified that in the case of this inhibitor that contains an indane ring and the other ring uh, is a meta disubstituted chlorophenyl ring, that uh, in the close vicinity of this uh, uh, dichlorophenyl uh, ring, there is a cysteine residue, particularly this is cysteine 153. Uh, when we investigated uh, the 3D structure of the ligand protein complex, we identified that this cysteine is located pretty close to the dichlorophenyl uh, ring. So therefore we hypothesized that if we replace the dichlorophenyl ring with an N-methylated uh, heterocycle, then we would be able to specifically label uh, this cysteine, and we would be able to develop uh, the uh, first uh, covalent uh, age decade inhibitor. So therefore, we designed a dif uh, different uh, N-methylated uh, compounds. Uh, basically, the question was that how exactly we should connect uh, the two main recognition elements, uh, one the indane ring and the other one is the N-methylated heterocycle. So we designed uh, different linkers and uh, all of these compounds were dark to the active site of the uh, enzyme. You could see here uh, evaluating the different dark, uh, ideas by docking and uh, uh, I also indicated the relevant docking uh, energies as indicated by this, these numbers here. So in the first round, uh, we prepared these two compounds <clears throat> uh, having a reasonably low uh, docking score. However, unfortunately, we were not able to identify any uh, 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 protein blocking or protein inhibitory activity with these compounds. So therefore, uh, we synthesized uh, two types of compound with low, with uh, less flexible, uh, less flexible and uh, shorter, uh, basically shorter uh, linker. Uh, as demonstrated uh, here with a 752 and 759. And fortunately enough, we were able to identify that uh, the medium size linker, uh, the compound with the medium size linker 752 and in the N methylated version blocked. Uh, the enzyme very active, actively in a low micromolar region. And fortunately enough, uh, when we tested the compound against uh, uh, the uh, age like eight dependent cell lines, uh, we were able to demonstrate reasonable uh, IC50 values in both cell lines. So the last example I would like to show you, uh, this is related to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemia. Uh, 
uh, we collaborated with Near London and uh, uh, Frank von Delft uh, at the Diamond Light Source UK and uh, uh, provided these heterocyclic uh, electrophilic uh, library for screening uh, against uh, a number of uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins that included uh, the main protease and also uh, NSP3, another non-structural protein of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And here you could see that uh, screening uh, our library together with, with uh, other libraries, more specifically uh, covalent libraries provided uh, by near London of Weizmann Institute, uh, we were able to identify uh, a couple of uh, binding sites available. And here you could see our fragments uh, bound uh, to the cysteine residue available at the major binding site of, uh, of MPRO. So in summary, uh, I showed you that uh, we have developed a number of different fragment libraries. Uh, in addition to the mapping library, uh, we also developed the covalent, concentrated new covalent mini uh, These 145 electrophilic heterocycles were characterized and they, they represent the new overhead chemotypes with tunable reactivity. We investigated uh, this library against different targets, including HDAC8 and SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, main protease. And uh, we were able to identify unprecedented binding packets available for covalent targeting. At the end of my talk, uh, I would like to mention that also the and methylated and non-methylated heterocycles are available for all the ALOG members uh, for screening. And uh, just very recently, uh, we agreed uh, with Anamin uh, just commercializing the library for uh, larger scale applications uh, to identify a new uh, car, uh, binding packets and allosteric packets for uh, tar covalent targeting. At the end of my talk, I would like to uh, acknowledge all of the contributors of this work and thank you very much for your kind attention. So yeah, thank you for the talk. And uh, as always, I think we have time for some questions. So, uh, Feel free to unmute yourself, or if you want, you can type them uh, in the chat and I will read them uh, for you. Uh, Zoe already wrote one. So yes. Zoe, do, do you want? Yes, I'm yeah. just checking. So, yes, thank you, uh, Georgi. It was a wonderful webinar, I really enjoyed it. And uh, yes, we hear even more often and more often that uh, there is more covalent inhibitors becoming drugs now approved by the FDA in other countries. And uh, I wanted to ask uh, probably a rather naive question, but since I'm not uh, working with a topic, uh, I would like to ask what would be the side effects of uh, covalent inhibition in proteins and how can one ensure specificity uh, for the probe or the molecule for the desired target? I mean, how it's clear for example, if you're targeting MPRO in uh, COVID, you want to destroy the virus. So because these proteins are unique to the virus, uh, you don't care. So covalent is just perfect. But if you're targeting a human protein, how do you know that it will not also react with another amino acid of another protein, another target? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zoe, for the question. And this is a highly relevant uh, a question, just because uh, in the last decades, I think that was the most important uh, fear associated with covalent uh, inhibition. So basically, uh, 
in uh, the last decades, virtually all of the covalent inhibitors were discovered by serendipity. And only in the last decade, I mean uh, the last 10 years, uh, there was a significant change uh, in the strategy, how we can develop covalent inhibitors. So therefore, uh, there are a number of colleagues contributed very significantly to the field, identifying the factors, how exactly we can design uh, covalent inhibitors with reduced uh, risk of side effect. I would like to uh, mention Kevin Shokad, uh, who is uh, clearly uh, one of the pioneers of, of, of these uh, approaches. So clearly the point is that now we have design principles, how to make covalent inhibitors with less uh, risk of side effect. What are the most important design principles? The first is that, that basically I'm, uh, so my, in my talk, I focus to covalent fragments, right? So, uh, if you have a small molecule, uh, like fragment, uh, the, uh, the non-covalent and non-electrophilic part of the fragments would form only limited interactions with the protein. And uh, basically with fragments, you can explore, uh, you know, the reactivity of uh, the targeted residue, but uh, you could not expect a very large specificity of uh, covalent fragments because they are small. Mm -hmm. However, if you check, for example, the covalent uh, protein kinase inhibitors, these are pretty large molecules, right? They are forming specific interactions within the, their binding site. These interactions are typically non-covalent, right? And uh, just making uh, you know, the irreversible covalent bond uh, uh, to, the, to the binding site, they have one single electrophilic substituent. So therefore, I mentioned that the first step of covalent inhibi inhibition is the recognition of the non-covalent complex. Uh, okay. This would give you the specificity, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because if your compound uh, having an electrophilic moiety could not fit to a binding site, then basically the chance of labeling would be very, very small. So uh, one of the design principles is clearly just to design your molecules forming specific interactions within the target. Uh, why we think that it is especially useful for the allosteric compounds because you know that the allosteric sites are even more specific, right? So when combining allosteric with a covalent mode of action, that would be a perfect choice, you know, just uh, ensuring that those covalent complements uh, might have even less uh, uh, side effect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, Jonathan, I see that you have a question. Yes, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, yes, you, you kind of fits what you were talking about. So you, you also mentioned cryptic pockets, and I what I would be interested in is how the um, mechanism of the covalent fragments or covalent compounds would change if you consider the pocket to be opened first. Let's say, mm -hmm. is it the same mechanism or does it change? Do we need different kind of covalent probes for that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh... In the case of uh, the cryptic packet, uh, it is my, my experience uh, that we should focus to really small fragments, right? Because this is the key in, uh, for the cryptic packets that they are typically not open, right? However, uh, when we investigated uh, the available mining sites with computational tools like FTMAP, probably you, you, you know that, right? Uh, we observed, uh, so FTMAP is particularly very effective identifying even cryptic sites. But what is the reason behind? Because 
we observed uh, when we investigated uh, available binding sites with FDMF together with the Boston University people that basically at the very entrance of, of these cryptic packets, there is a sm very small hole. These are typically used by a couple of water molecules, not too much, uh, uh, basically up to, up to three or four, right? Just because FTMAP probes are even smaller than the usual fragments, you know, they are able to detect even these very, very small binding sites, right? So therefore, when Aztecs reported the mini frags as uh, they were able to identify even unprecedented sites, that is the reason why these extremely small, extremely low molecular weight fragments as mini frags could touch these uh, sites. However, the problem was that, that they should use you know, high millimolar screening concentration in the X-ray screen. And uh, sometimes uh, these extremely high concentrations pro uh, uh, provided artifacts. So that was the, our motivation, just replacing, you know, the, 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 the minifag uh, uh, or, or using the minifag concept, but extending, extending with the covenant warhead that still the fragment is pretty small, uh, still it could identify, you know, the small, small holes routinely occupied by only water molecules. And if there is at least a nucleophilic residue, not obviously cysteine, but you can consider the lysine and also tyrosine because uh, some of these, uh, heterocycles could label other than cysteine residues as well, then we can catch that point. So we have an unpublished example for a, for a kinase, a protein kinase, right? Identified a cryptic site using uh, this approach. Uh, interestingly, uh, this site is known for other type of kinases, but never ever observed for certain theronine kinases. Uh, so this is an indication, you know, that uh, since allostric, the position of allostric sites are usually conserved. Uh, however, you simply couldn't recognize very easily just because of the different amino acid content of the, of the site that we are able to detect even the cryptic sites. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, our experience with cryptic sites still limited. So uh, these are early observations that gave us some confidence that probably this approach would help a bit identifying those cryptic sites that contains uh, at least one uh, electrophilic residue for labeling. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so we have another question in the chat from uh -huh. Sancho. And uh, he says, uh, even if you achieve selectivity uh, surrounding the, the warhead to form specific interactions with the protein, um, then can the, the reactive group uh, react in other places uh, when in vivo or in cells, like for example, with uh, small metabolites and this can cause maybe unexpected effects. So it was, uh, uh, his question if, if this is checked in the, the design process. Yes, uh, thank you, Franco, uh, for this uh, additional point. Uh, I did not mention uh, when uh, I responded to the question of Zoe. Uh, because at that time, I focused pretty much for the non-covalent interactions that would make uh, the covalent inhib inhibitor specific uh, against the uh, protein. However, you are absolutely right. Uh, even in this case, if you are using highly reactive electrophilic functionalities, that would provoke uh, uh, some side effects. Uh, let me 
add just one very trivial uh, uh, point. And this is GSH. GSH is available at relatively high concentration in every elite cell, right? So if, for example, you your uh, molecule contain a highly reactive functionality, like in my case, I, I, I pointed out that several times that MALA emits, for example, these are highly reactive electrophiles, right? And they are reacting not only uh, uh, the protein, but they are also very, very active against GSH. And that is absolutely uh, unacceptable. So therefore, uh, we should focus uh, to the optimization of the warhead as well. Uh, up to now, most of the compounds reach the market, they contain acrylamides just because they, they are relatively mild electrophiles, right? Uh, however, there are some other electrophilic functionalities that could be used. However, we should optimize uh, the electrophilicity of the functionality against the targeted residue actually available for the binding site of the protein, right? Just because the nucleophilicity of the protein residue is pretty much dependent on the immediate, immediate surrounding of uh, uh, the residue available within the binding site of the protein. Therefore, in every and each protein, we should face with uh, a residue of with different pKa values, right? So therefore, we should very carefully adjust the necessary electrophilicity to the actual nucleophilicity of the residue we are targeting in a given protein, right? So that is how we can avoid the unwanted uh, electrophilic reaction or nucleophilic reaction of the electrophiles within the cell, for example, uh, just reacting with GSH. So therefore, we should opt, uh, the short answer is that we should optimize uh, also uh, the, the warhead uh, part of the rest uh, of, of, of the molecule. Yeah, hi, Mark. Hi. So I would have a question concerning the uh, com a comparative study about uh, non-covalent fragments and covalent fragments, because a lot of information in fragment-based drug design is about uh, non-covalent interactions and so on. And in a way, with the reactive warhead, you mix two kind of layers of molecular recognition. And do you check also uh, frequently for the uh, kind of non-covalent counterpart with regard to the recognition, if it still binds and recapitulates at least the binding region? Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, 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 thank you for the question uh, because uh, when I'm answering to this point, uh, I can emphasize that uh, the covalent methodology is not only useful to develop covalent, let's say, drugs or uh, or, or, cov or, or compounds with covalent mechanism of action, but at least with the same importance we can use uh, covalent fragments just to identify binding sites that otherwise would be available for non-covalent uh, molecules as well. In this case, we can consider a covalent fragment screen or a covalent screen against the target like a, like a, a target engagement study, right? Just trying to identify new binding sites. If uh, you can change 
the nature of the fragment or the nature of the hit or the lead or, or even later uh, stage of the optimization to non-covalent, then you would very obviously avoid any uh, a side effect that are otherwise associated with the electrophilic functionalities. However, uh, your question was uh, basically how to compare uh, uh, these two. Uh, I didn't mention in my uh, presentation uh, right now. Uh, however, we developed uh, a library of, of photo activable uh, fragments. So these are uh, uh, the basically uh, for this purpose you mentioned, uh, uh, Mark, because uh, what we are doing here uh, that we are screening these uh, uh, Paul tagged li uh, fragment library uh, against the target. Uh, and if the otherwise the non-covalent fragment is recognized uh, by uh, the target, then when irradiating the sample, uh, only those fragments uh, will cross couple with the target uh, that otherwise could form the effective non-covalent interaction, right? And uh, basically we can screen this uh, photo-activated fragment, uh, photo-activated tagged fragment library against the target with and without irradiation. And this is the way how we can easily compare uh, the non-covalent and the covalent uh, uh, version of the same uh, uh, fragment. If we irradiating the sample, then it became uh, uh, it becomes covalent and uh, can uh, across uh, uh, coupled with the uh, uh, protein. However, what we found is that that we were able to identify more covalent fragments to be bound to the protein target than fragments that could bind without the help of covalent bond formation. And this is basically, again, the question of the concentration, right? Because I mentioned that uh, if you are running the fragment screen in high concentration, then you can use biophysical methodologies to identify uh, a fragments that otherwise has no biological effect, right? So only touch somehow, you know, the, the binding side that they could provide a very good starting point. However, uh, they are functionally neutral. Right. Uh, so, therefore, my conclusion is that adding covalency, we can detect uh, fragments with significantly lower concentration, and we can test uh, the biological uh, impact of these fragments more easily. So that is the advantage. Yeah, thank you very much. Just for advocating covalency, you know that, you, of course you know, Neomatrel via, the Paxlovid drug, is of course covalent. Yes. And if it devoids the warhead, it's almost inactive. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so are there any uh, other questions? Well, it doesn't seem so. So if that's all, uh, I will uh, close the meeting. Thank you again, Professor uh, Kiseru, and um, uh, see you at the next, uh, the next Allod uh, uh, webinar. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of thank the you. audience. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye bye. You're great. <laughs>